Okay, up to this point, we have talked about temperature changes as indicators whether a process is exothermic or endothermic. It should be clear, hopefully, at this point. And if something is endothermic, that means that they are, or this process, is absorbing energy. So think of a reaction or a physical process where this is occurring right here. And if it's endothermic, then what we have is we have energy flowing into the chemical reaction or the physical change if it's like a phase change of a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. And because heat is flowing into the reaction, that means the surrounding area's temperature has to go down, always. The temperature tells us that we lost energy. So therefore, temperature is telling something, is telling us something about the energy. What I will say at this point is we cannot measure energy of a book or a calculator. We can only measure the change of energy. And temperature is very important. It tells us something about heat being lost or gained. Just as if we had a reaction that's exothermic or a chemical pro I'm sorry, or a physical process like a uh, gas going to a liquid or a liquid going to a solid. In an exothermic process, the heat is released into the environment. Therefore, if the heat is being released, therefore the temperature of the environment has to and always goes up. Now, it's important to realize that the reaction um, for an endothermic doesn't get warm because it absorbs heat. It uses or consumes the heat to do something with it. Whereas the exothermic process releases heat, it itself does not get colder. It is releasing the heat as a result of A going to AB, or in this case, going from a high energy state, unstable, to a low, to A to B, as we've been talking about. But this temperature is an indicator. It helps us guide us how the energy is flowing. And as we learned today, heat always flows from hot to cold. Now the reason is because heat flows from what? Movement. As I, the analogy I gave in class, I have football players running around and going fast. I have geeks in a park measuring blades of grass. They're not moving very much. Who is going to move toward who? All the faster moving particles are going to eventually meet the cold particles. And when they hit them and collide with the geeks, the cold particles will go a little bit faster. And maybe the football team gets slowed down as they run into the geeks measuring blades of grass on the lawn of Central Park. And that's too much information of something that never existed. Any case, the point being here is that heat flows from hot to cold because we know things that are warmer move faster. And that's what temperature is really about. Temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. So let's talk about that. We have our phase changes we talked about yesterday, solids to a liquid to a gas. We know we add heat to do that. And we know the temperature increases for liquids as you give them heat. So uh, temperature, and this is important, is a measure of motion energy. Okay, and we're going to define this. So temperature, okay, is a measure of motion. Now specifically, we know that molecules that have more energy move faster. They have a higher molecular speed. Okay. The thing is that when we say, let's say, a temperature, when we read a temperature to be, let's say, 30 degrees Celsius, and it gives the value of how much motion molecules are. We know that something that's 30 degrees Celsius has higher molecular speeds than something that is 60 degrees Celsius. Higher the temperature, the more motion those molecules have. What you may not understand, though, is that they all do not have, they all, all the molecules at a particular temperature do not have the same speed. Think about molecules as they move. Some are going to hit directly on others and make them go faster. The ones that hit them, or maybe two molecules, what, hit these two simultaneously, and this guy stays still for a while. Or think of a cue ball, if you ever played pool, hitting the eight ball, and the eight ball goes flying, but this one stays still. If you think of it, molecules cannot go the same speed. We may have a temperature given for a whole group of molecules, 
but we can never have them at the same speed. So the important thing here is temperature is the average motion of molecules. In fact, we're going to change motion to the word kinetic. Kinetic is a word that represents motion. So temperature is the average kinetic energy. Okay, it's only an average of all the motion. Therefore, it's 60 degrees Celsius. We know that molecules on an average are going much, much faster than those at 30. It would not be double, and we'll talk about that at some length. So when we say something has a higher temperature, we say the average of all the particles mo moving are higher. There's going to be some moving faster and some moving less. And this makes a lot of sense to, let's say, water. We know that water can evaporate it at all temperatures. Why? Well, the ones going faster are the ones that can escape the liquid. Okay? But I'm going to now go to a demonstration using a molecular model demonstrator to show that molecules have a range of motion. So what I have here is a molecular motion demonstrator. Essentially what I have is little beads here that represent atoms or molecules, and I have this little aluminum sides that are going to shake by this electric motor, and I'm going to demonstrate something about temperature. Temperature, as we're learning, is a measure or an indicator of changes of energy. We know things that get warmer, obviously their temperature goes up. Things that get colder, their temperature drops. So temperature is an indicator. And what temperature really is, is a measure of the average motion. We call motion energy kinetic energy. So let's turn this on. And you can see that these molecules are moving a little bit. Some are actually have stopped. And the ones with no motion have no temperature. That's the coldest possible temperature. We're going to call that absolute zero in a little, little while. Let me just increase the motion here, hopefully. And then moving up the table. And what you can see is that in a system of beads hitting the container walls, this is a great example that shows that although we may have a certain temperature, this could represent, let's say, 80 degrees Celsius for a gas. And what you're seeing is, is that the molecules are not all moving at the same speed. Some are clearly going faster, and some are barely moving at all until they get a hit. So what temperature is, is a measure of entire system's average motion. Some are going faster, some are going slower. So it's an average kinetic energy. Obviously, when we shut down all of the uh, electricity here, now I have no motion. And this would be the coldest possible temperature, which we're going to call absolute zero. So temperature is not a measure directly of energy that we can quantify. It is an indicator, but what it really is is an average motion energy. So that when we, we when I go to Boltzmann distribution graphs in a second, we can see that. But again, as I as they go faster, this would indicate a higher and higher temperature. Think about a solid. Solid has a what? A regular repeating crystal structure. Let's put that right there. Let's increase the energy. Let's make this solid absorb energy like an endothermic process. And it's going to vibrate more, maybe. And then if I keep heating it, it absorbs more and more energy until maybe that energy is used to melt it and eventually get into the gas phase. I had to add energy to make these molecules go faster. This is an example of how temperature works. These are talking about the motion of particles and some are hitting each other head on and some aren't. Temperature can never be or you can never say that the speed of molecules are always at the same speed. We're only going to have an average because some will go faster, some will go slower. And we're going to plot that with distribution graphs, something called a Boltzmann distribution graph that right now. visual helps. You saw that some molecules are going faster and slower, and therefore we're going to have a range of speeds. So this is called a Boltzmann distribution graph. And what this is going to show us, that range of speeds. So on the left 
hand side, okay, the uh, basically the dependent variable, okay, is the number of particles and speed is the independent bar variable. And what we're going to have is we're going to show that at a certain temperature, for instance, let's make this uh, 30 degrees Celsius. So at 30 degrees Celsius, so the red equals 30 degrees Celsius, this is the range of speeds. Now, what am I looking at? Well, this is, the, this, this is speed, the higher speeds here. What makes this curve? Well, if you look carefully, you would see that this is the number of molecules. If I was to stack the number of particles, each X represent, let's say, a particle or an atom. If I stack them like a, a bar graph, you would see that there's a greatest number of particles at this temperature, or this speed, I should say. So you can see that at, at 30 degrees Celsius, okay, most of the molecules exist in this area, which means they all are very similar. You're going to have some that are going faster and some that are lower. Notice the ones over here to stack your X's, there's a lot less, what, number of molecules on this side. So, as we, this, so this is basically the mean. So that we definitely have a mean speed. In AP chemistry, we'd call this the root mean square speed, but don't worry about that. So what I want you to get is that most molecules are close to the average. X is an average. All right. Some are going to be way below. Those are the ones that got hit and stayed still very, uh, very, very still. And then there's going to be ones that, that are going really fast. Now, we know this is true because, well, we know that if I take a, a, a puddle of water. Okay, that's a crazy puddle of water. All right. We know that it evaporates even on a cold day. How, is that, how can that be? How can water evaporate on a cold day? Well, even cold water is going to have enough, what? Molecules that are going fast enough that can leave. So let's draw a line here. Let's be crazy and draw a orange line. And this line represents the divider of molecules that, let's say, could escape the liquid phase and go into the gas phase. Notice I'm just drawing only a few can do that at this temperature. Now, this is a pretty warm temperature, but this is only a model. Now, Let's pretend I increase the temperature to, let's say, um, 60 degrees Celsius. Now, at 60 degrees Celsius, remember, what's making this curve is the number of molecules. What's going to happen is this curve is going to flatten out. The area stays the same, but what happens is there's a greater range of molecules. And if you were to stack up your X's, you could see that there's going to be a lot more molecules that pass this divider that have what? High enough kinetic energy to escape into the gas phase. And that's why as the day gets warmer, evaporation occurs faster. And if I go to, let's say, let's change my colors. Let's go to, um, I don't know, uh, I can't do it, magenta. If I go to 80 degrees Celsius, this would flatten out even more. But as you can see, there's more molecules that are past this line. And that's why when we get to 100 degrees Celsius, that's a special, special temperature, that that's the average. Every single molecule has about the average energy to overcome themselves and become a liquid. That's the maximum evaporation. So most of these can, can get over this. But the bottom line is we're distributing our particles. Notice there's a range of speeds. Even at 80 degrees Celsius, there's still going to be some molecules that are on the lower end of the speed going very slowly. We have mostly the average here, but you're still going to have some slow and very fast. Remember, temperature is the average motion, average kinetic. We can't look at temperature and measure energy. And you know why? Because we don't know all the what? All the individual motions. If we knew that every single molecule was going the same speed at every temperature, then we could use temperature to measure energy. It only gives me an indicator. If you say to me, Mr. Grotsky, what do you mean? Well, if I got two regions classes and I've got one that's averaging in the class of 80, 80, um, 80 uh, a GPA of 80, and then I have another class that's averaging 60. Now, does that tell me that I have all bad students in the 60 class compared to the 80? No, it just tells me, it gives me an indicator that as a group, they're performing less or they're moving less. See the analogy? So kinetic energy, and because molecules move, what? Different speeds at the same temperature, what we're going to have is just an indicator of energy. So as I add energy to the system, as I turn up my, um, 
my, my electrical demonstrator, they went faster and the averages went up. There was still some that are going slow, but you still had more going higher. So as the average increases in the class, as the average motion increases in a system, you have more molecules going faster, more students doing better, but it's just an indicator. We can't use it to measure total energy because we don't know the, all the individual speeds. To measure energy, you have to know every single molecule's speed, and that is just impossible. So temperature is an average kinetic energy. And it's important you understand it's an indicator of heat flow, not a direct um, value for energy. Okay, so let's take out our temperature scale worksheet that I gave you. And it's an honor to teach you guys. All right. And um, what we're going to do here is we're going to please follow along and listen. These are the three scales that we'll be using, primarily Celsius and Kelvin. But I can't go to Celsius and Kelvin without mentioning how they the Fahrenheit story came along. So let's continue. So Fahrenheit was um, a, uh, a man who was um, lost his family and was a ward of the state as a young man. And they were apprenticing him to do, uh, I, I don't know what the apprenticeship was, but the state, and this is now 1714, I believe, uh, or around there. So this is very, very, very early time period. But Daniel Fahrenheit was the first person to build to build, I'm sorry, a working thermometer that could actually measure uh, the same temperature uh, for the same object. Okay, and it seems that seems like that was not a big deal. Well, you think about this for a second. They had thermometers back in the day, and they were just devices that were fun to use. A lot of them were like just big dish, like big uh, containers that had a very small little tube up, and all they saw was the liquid would expand up the tube. Sometimes that liquid was wine. And this is called a Florentine thermometer. And they would measure how high the liquid would go. Now, the liquid goes up because as temperature increases, as you guys know, the molecules move what? Move faster. Therefore, they need more space. So as things heat up, liquids expand because their density drops, right? The mass stays the same, mass over volume. But the volume increases because the liquids are moving more. So they saw this, but it was only a novelty, meaning you could just take it out and say, how high is it today? You may mark it as the highest day. But, but what um, Fahrenheit did, which was the first, he set his thermometer to, and I'm going to write this because it's so important, to fixed points. Okay? Fixed points. He was the first person to calibrate these things to fixed points. Now, why did he do that? Because he realized if I uh, calibrate my thermometer to temperatures that I know don't change, I can use that as a reference point. All right. Now we had a couple different fixed points uh, in his thermometers. Now his thermometers weren't the same as the Florentine, but he designed these. And he did this with the state actually trying to catch him. And I think his parents, and I know his parents actually died by, easy, by eating poisonous mushrooms of all things. Okay. So in any case, he built a thermometer, which is basically a small little tube with probably alcohol in it. Okay. And the alcohol expands, just like we talked about, because it's moving more at higher temperatures. What good is it unless you uh, assign a value? Because before then, they just kind of marked, hey, this is the hottest day, this was the coldest day. But he wanted to mark values to say, well, what's the baseline? What does this mean? What does this temperature mean? So what he did was, he, found, he said, well, let's make my fixed points the uh, freezing point of water. So H2O freezing. And he fixed... Uh, this top part, okay, or some part in between, I'm sorry, body temperature. Okay, and then he found the coldest temperature is an even mass, uh, an even amount of uh, salt to ice. And that was his zero. Okay, and then he calibrated his values to be zero, four, and twelve. And that's what he put on his, uh, his, his, his thermometer. And you say, well, why 0 to 4 to 12? Well, probably because he was an inventor. And during this in time, people were starting to gather in cities. And people, were, for the first time, needed to know what time it was. If I'm going to a job in a bigger city or town, when you're not in an agricultural environment where you went to, went to work when the sun came up, and the sun went down, you went home, you didn't know what time it was. So time was an issue. So we think that maybe the early, his early work was due to make a clock. Here's your 12 and here's your 6, um, your 3 and 9. So I think he was trying to build a device in a clock. But that didn't work out for whatever reason. 
So what he did was he times everything by 8. You say, well, why 8? Well, think about it. Times it by 8, that gives me 96. He times the 4 by 8, and that gave him 32. And, of course, that's still 0. 8 times 0 is 0. And that's where the freezing point or melting point of water is 32, a weird and odd value for Fahrenheit. And, of course, we know now that our body temperature is, what, 98.6. So this was adjusted later, okay? And, of course, his zero. So that's why the Fahrenheit has weird numbers. Now, you may say, well, why did he do that? Well, he also found that the freezing point, I'm sorry, the boiling point of water, which was a fixed point, was uh, 212. So if I get rid of these values, I'm going to explain why he probably did it. Well, I can't ask him. So 212 was the boiling point of water. 32 degrees was the um, freezing point of water. And here's our zero, that salt ice mixture. Okay, and you may say, well, why did he do it? Well, if you look carefully, 212 to 32 is 180. Yeah, and you say, okay, what's 180? Well, 180 degrees, my friends, is half a circle. So maybe he was thinking about building a gauge that it was a 180 gauge where you could go from zero to 180, and maybe that was another way. That's what we think anyway, but yeah, he had a 180 degree scale, and that survived, okay, and still survives today in the English scale. But a few years later, about 20 so years later, in about 1738, some guy named Andy Celsius came by and said, well, I'm not, I'm not liking these weird numbers, and I still don't like these weird numbers, but we're so used to them. He came by and said, let's make a thermometer, same basic system, liquid that expands as, it gets temp as the temperature goes up because the average kinetic energy goes up, all right? Uh, he said, let's make a, this based on two fixed points, and the two fixed points are the freezing point of water, same idea, freezing point, and it's a point because the temperature doesn't change, as we'll learn more about, and the boiling point of water. Okay, it's a point because that temperature doesn't change. And he actually narrowed these down to, uh, to consider the amount of pressure that's on the liquids at that time. We're going to learn that pressure affects boiling points and freezing points, but for right now, he really did a lot of work to make sure that he knew his fixed points meant something. So at a certain pressure outside, he made water boil at 100. Now, he didn't make the water physically boil. He just made his thermometer. He noticed his tube, when it rose up, he noticed it stopped at a certain temperature as the water was boiling. And we now know why. When water is boiling, the temperature stays constant because the energy being absorbed by the liquid endothermically, hey, is being used to make the water go to a gas at the same temperature. So he made that 100. And then he watched it drop when the freezing occurred, another phase change, and he made that zero. So this was a 100 to zero scale, sometimes called the centigrade scale. And he made a hundred markings in between, and that Celsius thermometer is what a lot of people use today, okay? It's a nice system. It's nice because it's a zero to hundred. We all know the numbers. Boiling point of water is zero. Why? Because he made it that way. He noticed when this level dropped and it stayed constant at the freezing point. Why? Because the H2O what? liquid when it became a H2O solid at the same temperature, energy was being released exothermically. Okay, now where'd we go from here? Well, um, a guy named Lord Kelvin, okay, about a hundred and some odd years later, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 1848, William Thompson was his name, okay, he didn't like these numbers because he saw there was a zero for freezing point of water. And he realized, thinking back to my uh, demonstration, molecules are still moving at zero. So my friends in chemistry, that's not going to work. So what he did was, all right, what he did was, he said, let's go figure out what the coldest temperature would be in Celsius. Okay, and we're going to call that zero. So what he did was he found out, and this is the lab we're going to do, that the coldest possible temperature is negative 273 degrees Celsius. And he saw after that temperature, there was no more mo motion. So the coldest temperature, meaning what? No more motion of molecules, no more kinetic energy. The average was zero. There was no motion. He called that absolute zero. So he made that zero. 
So he made Celsius scale start 273 degrees sooner. And because he used Celsius scale, he didn't create a new scale. He used the same degree. So a Celsius degree was the same as a Kelvin. They don't put a degree sign on the Kelvin because that would mean you have your own set of units. Kelvin used Celsius scale. He just made it start 273 degrees, de uh, degrees sooner. So therefore, between 0 and 273, this must be 273. And let me just get rid of the, the date here. The boiling point of water in Kelvin is 373. In Celsius, it's 100. In Kelvin, it's 273 degrees higher. Why? Because he wanted a zero temperature to mean no more motion. In Celsius scale, when you say zero degrees Celsius, it may imply there's no motion, but there's plenty of motion. We know that food spoils in a freezer because there's still motion by bacteria. But if you had a freezer at absolute zero, there would be no bacteria living. So there is still molecular motion at zero. So he didn't like that. He wanted his zero Kelvin to mean no more moving. So his scale is the same, except a 273 degree difference. So Kelvin is equal to the Celsius scale plus, guess what, 273. Celsius boils at 100. So if I was to convert, I put 100 here. And then, of course, I add 273, and the answer is 373. And that's all you've got, all we have. So a Celsius going to uh, Kelvin and Kelvin going to Celsius, you will use this formula, which, by the way, is given to you in table T of your reference table. All right. Now, Fahrenheit and Celsius, that's for another course. I love to spend more time about the conversion of both, and it's pretty neat. But it's not, it's beyond the scope of our course. So for homework, what I'd like you to do is convert the following. Number four, all right, and uh, that's all we can do, I guess, in this homework here. All right, so Fahrenheit to Celsius to Celsius. So I just want you to try number four, and let's just change one for, for all time. Make, let's make this negative 20 degrees Celsius into Kelvin. And let's make this one into Celsius. Okay, so I'm going to make 3, negative 20 goes into Kelvin, and 296 Kelvin go into Celsius. And you're going to use what? Kelvin equals Celsius plus 273. So I want you to do 7, 4, and 3. And you're changing number 7 into Celsius. You're changing number 3 this into Kelvin and four uh, into uh, this one we can do. And we'll, let's, why don't we do this to, no, we'll do that, fine. So three, four, and seven, make those changes, try those, and I'll have a new key posted. Okay.